This game is hard. These are the words an enemy player typed in the chat as my friends and I proceeded to steamroll through their team. Depending on who you are, those words may have a different effect on you. You might have immediately thought, suck it up and get good. Or you might have felt those words deep in your soul as you remember dying for the fifth time in a row off spawn as support when all you wanted was to have a chill rank session with the boys. Feeling bad for what was clearly a new player experiencing the existential dread of being hopelessly outmatched, I responded, it gets better. But then the thought crossed my mind, does it really get better? Recently, the Overwatch developers came out and stated that the average new player was far less skilled than they anticipated. More specifically, while the devs initially thought inexperienced players would settle somewhere around low silver, their actual performance was closer to the bottom of bronze. This is understandable, because even though people coming in may have experience with shooting games, they may not understand the ins and outs of Overwatch. Terms like target priority, counterpicking, or even flanking. What makes this more believable is that unlike the first game, Overwatch 2 is free. So it's likely many of these players have never played anything like Overwatch before. To a practiced player, something as elementary as don't stagger in feels like common sense, but an inexperienced player may not even consider the idea that approaching the enemy without their team will only serve to get them killed and feed ult charge to their opponent. It's also clearly visible from Blizzard's own data that while the skill distribution in Overwatch 2 is mostly the bell curve you would expect, players are skewed more towards the lower end of the skill spectrum. Of course, since the free-to-play model has attracted newcomers to the genre, this is to be expected, and the skill curve should normalize over time. But this new player disadvantage raises an important question as we move further and further into this model of games as a service. Who is game balancing for? Over the past few years, watching the gaming industry change, I've realized that I am now an old man and the gaming landscape of my childhood is gone, likely forever. When I was growing up, games were standalone projects that would release, remain relevant for a year or so, and then either fade into obscurity or entrench themselves as enduring classics. And the only real way to keep a good multiplayer game alive was to release sequels. That's why games like Halo 3 exist, even when the vast majority of players would agree that Halo 2 was perfect. More importantly, games couldn't really be changed all that much once they had been released. And even when the tools to adjust game balance existed, the changes weren't massive. Most of the time, a player could take a break from their favorite game, come back a few months later, and essentially pick up where they left off. After all, why make drastic changes when you can save those for the sequel? Sliding didn't get added to Titanfall until Titanfall 2. Sprinting didn't get added to Halo until Halo Reach. Even as late as Destiny, major overhauls to the primary weapon meta didn't happen until they made the sequel. The impact of games being static like this is that communities would come together and solve the game, discovering broken techniques and figuring out the optimal way to do things. A new player coming into this environment would have been silly to complain because they were spending money to join a club where the members had an obvious head start. There wasn't some marketing push from Activision telling you to buy Modern Warfare 3 two years after release. Your suffering was kind of your own fault, and you either bit the bullet and got good, or you said this game sucks and moved on with your life. Fast forward to the modern day and everything has changed. With the exception of a few, games that were expected to have sequels have either been left behind or have dug their heels into the live service model. And with this model have arisen new debates and issues. Most notably, a new schism has emerged, a rift between the skilled players and the noobs. There have always been those at the top of the skill ladder who look down at those below them with a disdain that just screams get good. And there were always scrubs at the bottom hating on anyone slightly better than them. But you Usually these were outliers. Back then, most good players were just dude bros that loved the game and most low skill players looked up to them. Nowadays though, it seems like the negative sentiments have spread. In almost every competitive game now, there are low skill players who think the game is miserably difficult, high skill players that think the game is catering too much to the scrubs, and people in both groups who think the devs are incompetent for listening to the other side. Overwatch 2 is uniquely positioned as a game that transitioned from the traditional model into the live service model for the most part anyway. As such, it's an ideal case study to see how these issues arise and may be able to provide insight for how to reduce these tensions moving forward. In only one month, Overwatch 2 was able to reach 35 million players, something it took the original game two years to accomplish. Obviously, that's in part because the game is free, but that is not the only reason. No matter how many people tell you the game is dying, Overwatch 2 has only grown its average monthly player count every month since release. 
While unfortunately I couldn't find the exact numbers on how many of these are new players, it's safe to assume that the nearly doubled concurrent player count shows the game is successfully bringing new people in. In addition, the previously shown skill distribution graphic also supports the idea that one of the reasons for this recent schism is the prioritizing of new or low skill players. There are some who will dismiss this idea as just a conspiracy theory with no backing. But for every potential conspiracy, there is one all important question. Would the entity being accused of conspiring benefit from said conspiracy? And in this case, the answer is a resounding yes. Making the game better for new players ensures that those trying the game out will stick around at least for a little bit longer. And for a live service game, the most important task is to constantly bring in and maintain new players. And if that information alone isn't enough to convince you that Overwatch 2 is balancing with low skill players in mind, then take a look at this. Sojourn is performing well at the highest tiers of competitive play, but poorly below those tiers. Much of the perception that she is too powerful seems to be driven by the reaction to dying to long-range charged headshots from her railgun secondary fire. These changes are aimed at reducing frustrations there, with the biggest change being the reduced critical multiplier for headshots. A fully charged headshot no longer kills a full health 200 HP hero. To help account for this loss of power, we're increasing the damage of her primary fire and how quickly her energy charges during her ultimate. In other words, while they acknowledged Sojourn's strength at the high level, they still gave her what could reasonably be called a buff to bring up her performance at lower levels of play. It's clear that Overwatch 2 is prioritizing lower levels of skill, and a quick glance across the gaming industry will show other examples of this same pattern. Just about every fighting game has started to implement powerful comeback mechanics. Shooters like Halo Infinite and Call of Duty have aim assist values that seem just a bit overtuned for controllers, Apex Legends is adjusting skill-based matchmaking to improve the experience with your less skilled friends, and if adding the Detroit Smash to Fortnite doesn't just scream for casuals, I don't know what does. There's something to be said about how these games are making room for the incoming noobs. At least, that's what some high skill players would have you believe. But I want to play a bit of devil's advocate. While some gamers may hold up games like Apex, Call of Duty, and Overwatch as these jewels of competitive integrity being tarnished by casual additions, I don't think that competition alone is their main goal. I would argue that these are all games made first to be a fun time that we as players have embraced the competitive nature of. Let's take Overwatch 2 for example. Yes, it's a team game that can breed a deeply competitive competitive environment. But if you've watched the recent Overwatch League games, you can see that that competitive environment comes at the expense of the intended experience. When money is on the line and the game is being played as its most competitive, why run anyone but the most powerful heroes? And this is the mindset that overtakes competitive Overwatch. But this playstyle is antithetical to the intentions of the developer, which is to have a game where players are constantly switching up their hero depending on the presented situation. The very nature of this concept requires characters with advantages and disadvantages that lead to a rock, paper, scissors-esque gameplay loop. The original concept was successful not because it was perfectly balanced, but because it was fun. A similar story is true of other games. Battle royales like Apex are primarily casual experiences by nature. The very essence of the game is RNG. Sure, the Apex player base and the devs have leaned into the more competitive elements, but there will always be complaints about how you were screwed by the ring closure or the loot pool or the matchmaking because the game is designed to be random. In fact, in a perfect world where the game was absolutely fair, you would only win 1 in 20 games of Apex. That very fact takes away from the nature of competition where victory is determined by who can consistently win. And just to drive this point home, Call of Duty is a shooting game where leveling up gives you a huge advantage with attachments, and where a couple of shots to the back will kill an enemy, but the game has for years allowed you to spawn behind people. All of these are core elements of their respective games that make those games more casual. But in fact, the intention has nothing to do with casual versus competitive. These factors were added to make the games more enjoyable. The most important job a game has is to be fun for the majority of its players. Since the majority of a game's audience are mid to low skill players, this means that games have historically balanced around the lower levels of play. This is nothing new. The only difference is that now we're in the era of live service games. In the past, game changes might be made in a yearly patch or in a sequel, but these days the changes can be made at virtually any time. And sometimes these changes might even be based on player feedback. And with this new system of providing feedback and frequent updates have come situations that really just didn't exist before. For starters, players feel like they can provide feedback that may influence developers. So we make videos, write blog posts, and DM game developers' personal accounts for some reason. 
But also, this new system gave us players access to a fresh flock of scapegoats. Maybe in the past, we could look at changes and be content to either move on or get over it. But now, we don't have to be content. We can tell the developers what we want. And if we don't get what we want, we can blame someone else. And in many cases, that someone else is the opposing skill group. Low skill players get mad about the Kraber losing its one shot potential. Pros and streamers get mad that Seer still hasn't been nerfed. And each group blames the other for their frustrations. And high level Overwatch 2 ladder players have also voiced their frustrations with how certain changes are clearly favoring the lower skill players. Skill levels have almost become these tribal groups constantly at war with one another to see who can get what they want from the developers. But this is where players like me are kind of at a loss. I'm a player with mediocre mechanical skill but decent game sense. So in most games, over time I end up somewhere slightly above the middle ranks. Depending on the game, I can fall into either the sweaty or the casual camp. And as a result, I can empathize with both sides. More importantly though, I can understand the business side of this issue. For the companies, there seems to be one correct method, balance for the lower skill level. I know there's gonna be a skill purist that gets mad at this, but try to hear me out. I'm simply breaking down the logic of the business side. Yes, it's true that your high skill players are more likely to stick around, so you should pay attention to them, but that's not how the companies see it. Let's take a look at the Overwatch 2 rank distribution and you'll see what I mean. If we assume that the high level of play is diamond and above, which is what every commenter on every platform would have you believe, that means 89% of the player base falls outside of the high tier level. It makes no sense from a business perspective to ignore 90% of your player base to appease the top end. I know there is a feeling that those players at the top are more dedicated and therefore deserve more from the developers, and from a human perspective, I hear you and I agree. But from a realistic business perspective, those dedicated high level players will keep playing regardless. Sure, they'll gripe and complain, but they're invested in the game for reasons of content or competition or just a love of the game, so they aren't going anywhere. Now, there are probably some of you watching who got very upset when you heard that last statement. And I wanna make it clear that I am not stating this as a fact, I'm merely trying to explain why the current balancing is centered on the lower levels of play. With that said, I tend to disagree with this method of balancing, but I don't think the solution is just to follow the high level opinion. I think the correct method is actually the inverse of the current Overwatch 2 approach. Right now, Overwatch 2 has clear bias toward the lower levels of play when balancing, but they also throw in some things meant to appease the upper tiers. For example, in the last patch, amid the many casual focus changes, they also buffed Orisa. In the lower levels of play, Orisa was already seen to be one of the more powerful tanks because of her high health pool, so giving her a buff made no sense. On the other hand, at the high level, it was immediately clear that the buff to Orisa was to make her a viable pick to deal with Roadhog. My proposal is that they flip this balancing strategy and instead cater the majority of changes to the high level of play while throwing in a few things to appease the low level players. And here's why. Take the Orisa buff for example. How many low level players do you think were even aware that Orisa was meant to counter Roadhog? How many low level players do you imagine recognize how strong Sojourn really is? Down below Diamond, some people still think Reinhardt is too strong. But more importantly, at lower levels of play, no two people can agree on what is and is not too strong because it depends entirely on what you're good at. If you're a player with solid hit skin aim, you probably think fair is a joke, but being pushed by a nemesis form Ramatra might be terrifying because you can't do enough solo damage to kill him. On the other hand, if you're a player who excels at controlling space, nemesis Ramatra may not scare you, but a good Widowmaker might feel totally broken. In lower levels of play, you're much less likely to find a consensus about what people want because no one is playing their respective characters to their fullest potential. But at the highest level, where players understand the ins and outs of the game, it's much more likely that the feedback about what's broken will be uniform between players. Sure, occasionally you'll have characters where they get it wrong, but for the most part, the high level players know what they're talking about and they tend to agree with each other. Let's be clear that when I say high level in this case, I'm actually excluding the pro scene meta. In most games, the professional matches are entirely different to the game everyone else is playing because there's extremely high team coordination and their opponents can be studied ahead of time to develop a strategy. In a game like Apex Legends, they go as far as to reveal their landing locations before the game starts. So pro play may influence the regular game, but in my opinion, it should almost never be used as the guiding source for balance changes. Streamers and high rank players though are often just players like you and me that know a lot more about what can be exploited. I don't say that to mean low level player input isn't valid. Unlike the games I talked about at the start, if a new player jumps into a live service game and is having a bad time, it isn't just their fault. Live service games do market themselves to new people and even make a point of how often they're able to usher in new players. So now, if the low level experience is miserable, then you have equally failed in your job of balancing. 
But there's a difference between reducing frustration and giving low level players everything they want. Because the truth is, they usually don't know what they want. And more often than not, they won't even recognize when something has changed unless it makes a massive difference at their level, which it usually doesn't. I bet the average player doesn't even feel the Ana damage and heal increase despite it being a pretty significant buff. So focusing efforts on balancing around this group can actually be a waste of time as the players you're working hardest to please may not even notice and you gain no goodwill as a developer. Inversely, if you make changes for the high level, you can guarantee that at very least they will notice. Along with this, the reason to prioritize high level players when balancing is that for the remaining 90% of players, the balance is only one piece of what makes the game work. The benefit of the live service model is that maintaining player attention isn't just about balance, it's about providing meaningful content. I raised this point in my Apex Legends review and some people disagreed with me, but the fact is, when a game provides meaningful content other than the core game mode, its player base will be less focused on the shortcomings of its balance or matchmaking. Consider this information. Overwatch 2 released with massive server issues, laughably unbalanced heroes like Zarya and Roadhog, and continuous complaints about the matchmaking and ranked systems. Yet despite these factors, the game's population only grew. You could see that as an odd mystery, or you can see it for the lesson it provides. Overwatch 2 offers more than just a single playable mode as content. I don't just mean a ranked and unranked mode, and I'm not including cosmetics as content, even though some of the skins have been incredible. Overwatch 2 has an entire library of casual modes that rotate on a regular basis and features curated playlists around the holidays. And all of that is without even talking about custom games. For most players, there comes a time when the core gameplay loop of your favorite game gets frustrating or maybe starts to feel a it stale. Having casual modes that deviate from the normal loop creates opportunities for players to enjoy the game without the stress of worrying about balance or competition, which makes those elements less of a factor for the average person. The irony of this strategy is that it isn't new at all. A large reason for the success of Halo was its casual modes like Infection, Griffball, and Forge. Note how the less popular Halo Infinite launched with none of these modes. The lesson that Overwatch 2 can teach us about gaming is actually just an old lesson that we've forgotten. Whether you're a high level sweat or a once a week casual, we all just want one thing, for games to be fun. And with the arrival of yet another limited time mode, it seems like Blizzard understands exactly what their casual audience is looking for. Well, kind of. If they could only lock down the balance for the competitive scene and then stick the landing with PvE, this game would not only succeed in far surpassing the original Overwatch, but it could become the benchmark for how competitive live service games should exist. I want to leave you with a clip from Flats that helped to inspire this video. But before I do, I just wanted to say thanks for watching. My videos take a lot of work and research, and even after all that, I'm never quite sure if they're good enough. So if you took the time to watch all the way to the end, let me know what you think. And if you enjoyed it, consider subscribing. Thank you again so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Take it away, Flats. I think it ended up starting to get lost on people is that most streamers are just gamers too. We also want the same things that you want. Casuals, competitive players, content creators, pro players, and devs are all on the same team. We're all on the same team. We're all trying to make the game good.